Breast implant illness is one of the most divisive issues in all of plastic surgery. There are extremes on both sides. There are plastic surgeons who say that breast implant illness is not real and it's all in women's heads. There are breast implant advocates who believe that all breast implants are toxic and they should ban them forever from anybody using them. And there's a lot of people in the middle. So what do I think and what does the science say? I've got the answers for you in this podcast today. Okay, so on this podcast, we're going to talk all about breast implant illness. Do breast implants actually make you sick? Well, many years ago, it's actually been many years, I think, since I have made a podcast about BII or breast implant illness. Uh, And so I think it was uh, about time for me to really update you on the studies that have been done since then, on what the science is saying, and whether breast implants really do make people sick. Uh, And I wasn't lying when I said at the beginning of this podcast that this really is one of the most divisive issues in plastic surgery. And just to let you know, my history of this is that I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon. As if you've been following me, you know this. I went through all of my general surgery residency training, plastic surgery residency. I did a year fellowship in um, aesthetic plastic surgery out in Beverly Hills. And I was always under the belief throughout all my training that implants were safe and that this belief that people had that implants may make you sick just wasn't true and that the studies show that it wasn't true. Um, Now, just a little bit about the history of breast implants and breast implant illness before we get into some of the more uh, current studies. Um, Breast implants have been used for many, many decades And back in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a big hubbub about whether implants were safe and whether they were causing autoimmune disease in women. Uh, And so at this time, there was a huge uproar uh, amongst women with breast implants who believed that their implants were making them sick. And then in 1992, the FDA went ahead and issued a moratorium on silicone breast implants, only allowing them to be used in an FDA-approved study. So at that point, silicone implants were essentially banned for use except in this study. Uh, Saline implants, however, were allowed to be used. And the belief was, let's study this more to make sure that women aren't getting sick from it. Well, at the time, one of the huge breast implant manufacturers, uh, Dow Chemical, went bankrupt from this. There were class action lawsuits and a huge deal. Um, And from 1992 all the way up to 2006, which really essentially was my entire training, Uh, We only used saline implants except when these patients were used in an FDA-approved study. So fast forward to 2006. uh, Abruptly, the FDA lifts the moratorium, the ban on silicone implants. Uh, In Canada, the uh, the ban was lifted at a similar time as well, and we were able to use silicone implants again. And not surprisingly, the next year, breast augmentation rose from being in the top five cosmetic procedures performed to being number one, and it has never looked back. Really, because of the release of the silicone implants, once again, the United States allowing anybody to get it, technically over the age of 22, uh, that caused the numbers of breast augmentations to skyrocket. Well, what it also did is it also gave support to those plastic surgeons and people who believe that implants did not make people sick. They said because the FDA lifted the moratorium, that is proof that BII, breast implant illness, is not real. Um, And that was what I was taught all this time, and that's what I believed for many years. Uh, And until (laughs) I started learning a little bit more about breast implant illness, and I went through my own um, journey, I guess, in the learning about this type of thing. So I started having patients telling me that, that they were reading stories online of people sharing their stories about breast implant illness and BII, and how they were getting better after their implants were removed. So initially, my belief is like, no, the studies, I was told that the studies show that implants don't make people sick. That's what I was always told, that this is what the studies say, and this is what I would even tell my patients. But the reality was, did I actually look at those studies? Or was I just regurgitating what was said at our conferences, what was written in our textbooks, and what my colleagues would tell me. And so I realized that I may not know something that I didn't know. 
And I started really thinking about it, and I went to these breast uh, implant illness websites uh, that were posted by lay people, not by plastic surgeons, and I started seeing studies in their literature that I had never heard of before. So I started looking up these studies, and I started realizing that there are a number, there's an entire kind of scientific group of these studies that have looked at BII that I was never aware of and that none of my colleagues ever told me about. And then I started looking at our studies about breast implants. And I I guess I knew this to an extent at the time, but maybe I didn't know quite to the extent that this was true. But the vast majority of these, the, the big studies were funded by the implant companies. And they were performed by plastic surgeons who are getting paid sometimes millions of dollars from these companies to perform these studies. So if you're working for a company and you are getting paid millions of dollars, you know, sometimes even per year potentially, to give lectures, to perform research, uh, and all that, and be a consultant, then do you think that maybe you would have an ulterior motive here? Do you think that maybe that could impact what you believe about implants? Um, And so I started realizing that there was a lot out there that I didn't know. And as I looked more and more at the studies, I realized that these studies really didn't look that closely at all these symptoms that women with BII have. And I started realizing that this whole phenomenon of BII, I think it might be real. So what is breast implant illness? Um, So let me give you a list of the symptoms of BII in order of how common they are. So the first one I'm going to mention is going to be the most common. And as I go through this list, we're going to go to less and less common, but still symptoms of BII. And there are there are lists online that you can find that have like over 40 symptoms of BII. But these are the most common according to recent studies. Fatigue, brain fog, joint pain, muscle pain and weakness, headaches, low libido, dry eyes, memory issues, anxiety, hair loss, numbness and tingling, insomnia, weight gain, cold intolerance, dry mouth, and depression. So me listing these symptoms, if you have breast implants, are you dealing with a lot of these? If the answer is no, then you probably don't have BII. If the answer is yes, then it's possible that the implants may have something to do with it. And and in these situations, you want to consider, first of all, timing. So when does BII occur? Well, in general, studies show that it occurs about an average of about one to four years after the implants are placed. Okay, so usually BII, these symptoms don't just show up the day after you have an operation or a week later or even a month or even sometimes six months later. Uh, Studies show anywhere from one to four years is kind of the average time period where symptoms of breast implant illness appear to show up. Um, So I'll tell you, I have patients who come to see me for breast implants in a consultation, and I still do breast implant surgery. I just educate my patients about it, um, and I go over the symptoms of breast implant illness with some of them, and I've been stopped at times, and I've had patients tell me, Dr. Yoon, I have breast implant illness. And I look at them, I go, but you don't have breast implants. And they go, I know, isn't that strange? And so these are symptoms, unfortunately, that you can get from a lot of different autoimmune disorders. And that's one of the problems with BII, okay, is that, you know, I get patients who have these symptoms, they don't even have implants, and then there are people who don't have these symptoms, they get implants, and then they get the symptoms. Uh, And so the timing is the first thing. Obviously, if you've got these symptoms and you don't have implants, or you've had these symptoms, and you get implants, and you still have them, well, then you got to consider the timing is, you know, suspect, and it's likely that you probably aren't getting sick from your implants. Um, But the timing, so you want to consider it. Um, So how do you diagnose breast implant illness? Okay, well, obviously, first thing, you want to look at the timing. Uh, Is there a blood test to diagnose breast implant illness? No. Is there an x-ray, or a CAT scan, or an MRI, or any other type of an imaging study that can tell you if you've got BII? Unfortunately, no. BII, breast implant illness, is a diagnosis of exclusion. And what that means is the only way to really diagnose it is if you try to diagnose any other reasons why this person may have these symptoms 
and you come up short, there's nothing else that comes up positive, then maybe you have BII, okay? And so that's usually how we find out is that people exhaust the possibilities. They go, they've, you know, they go, I'm sick. I've got all these symptoms. I don't know what's going on. My doctor has done a full workup. Everything is quote unquote normal, and we don't know what's causing my illness. And so then I tell them, look, could it be your implants? We don't know. We will only know if we remove the implants and see if you get better. Uh, and that's one of the most frustrating things about BII is that people who have it, there's no way to tell if your implants are making you sick, unfortunately, unless you take them out. Um, and the hard thing is, you know, it's it's easy if you have somebody who has implants and they don't want them anyway, and let's say maybe they're done with them or or um, they no longer feel that they're right for them. But there are people who come in who are really like their implants. They like how they look and feel with their implants. And to take them out can be really devastating for them. But they're sick, and they don't know if the implants are making them sick, and that's where it can become a very difficult situation. And that's where I do think in some cases some women decide, you know what, I'm just going to keep my implants even though I don't feel so great um, and, and it's a decision for each person to make individually. I wish and I hope that sometime in the future we'll have some type of study or test that we can do that will diagnose breast implant illness so that women will know that if we take your implants out, are you going to get better? So then who is at risk of BII? Uh, and that's also, I think, super important. If we have somebody who's thinking about breast implants, can we give that person a percentage of what chance they will have of getting BII? And unfortunately, the answer is no, we don't know. We don't know who's at risk of BII. Now, there are a couple of small studies that show that if you have a history of autoimmune disease, if you have a history of severe allergies, and interestingly enough, if you've got a history of irritable bowel uh, syndrome, if you've got irritable bowel, those are three things that may be connected with breast implant illness. You may have a slightly, you may have a higher risk of getting BII if you get breast implants if you have those things. Once again, um, irritable bowel, history of severe allergies, or autoimmune disease. Uh, But it's not really conclusive. Uh, But that's the only thing that we really have. We do not know what the risk factors of BII are. And, And unfortunately, that means that if you consider having implants, we cannot tell you what percentage chance you have of your implants making you sick. Um, And this is really, I think, one of the most uh, important pieces of information that we ideally would need to get and we would love to get because, you know, really when you undergo surgery, it is a risk-benefit analysis. And if you don't know what the chances of the, you know, the risk are, how do you make an informed analysis of that? It's tough. It definitely makes it tough. Okay. So what then causes breast implant illness? Well, we don't know, unfortunately, who's at risk, so we don't know necessarily what causes it either. There are a lot of hypotheses, and that's where some of the recent studies have looked at. Uh, So for example, one of the main hypotheses is heavy metals. Uh, Are there heavy metals in the implant shell that can be leached out of the implant and go into the body, causing people to get sick? Well, I would say, and according to studies, it is unlikely that BII is due to heavy metals. Uh, There was a recent study of 150 patients from 2022. So this was just published, you know, a year and a half or so ago. And they found higher levels of arsenic and zinc in the scar tissue capsules of people with BII. But they found lower levels of other heavy metals. Now, arsenic and zinc can be altered by lifestyle, such as eating a gluten-free diet, such as by smoking, taking supplements, and even by having tattoos. So even though there was slightly higher levels of arsenic and zinc in people who had implants and BII, and that is arsenic and zinc in the capsule, which is the scar tissue that surrounds the breast implant, there were other levels of heavy metals that were actually lower, and the arsenic and zinc levels appeared to also correlate with some of the lifestyles of people, like smoking once again, like having tattoos and taking supplements and eating a gluten-free diet. Um, So when this study of 150 people looked at heavy metals in the scar tissue surrounding those breast implants in the capsules, they didn't really find anything all that conclusive. It didn't seem to show a direct correlation or connection between increasing amount of heavy metals in the tissues and BII. Uh, And so I think it's unlikely that heavy metals um, are the cause of BII. Obviously, more studies would be helpful to be 100% sure. 
Um, how about silicone gel bleed? Well, what is silicone gel bleed? Well, silicone, which is made, the, silico- the outer implant is made of silicone rubber. The inner portion of the silic- uh, the inner portion of the implant can either be saline or salt water, or it can be silicone gel, or even a silicone liquid, or even more of a cohesive silicone that's almost like a solid. Now, back in the 80s and early 90s, the implants, the silicone implants that we used had a silicone liquid in them, so that if the implant would, let's say, get a tear in the shell, that liquid would come oozing out because it was a liquid. Um, after the moratorium was lifted with the new silicone implants, they are made of more of a cohesive gel. They're not a solid, but they're more of a gel substance, so they're not necessarily liquid. And the old liquid silicone implants would actually bleed through that shell to the point where it's kind of like it would almost dissolve through that shell and you can actually feel this slime layer on the old style implants. The newer implants are what we call low gel bleed. Because that silicone uh, is thicker, it does not tend to kind of diffuse through the shell much anymore and you don't get this kind of slime layer of silicone gel, what we call bleed, on the implants much anymore. Um, Now, we do know that when you get a higher silicone gel bleed, your body can react more to that by creating excess scar tissue like a capsular contracture. And that's that capsule, that scar tissue covering, getting actually thick uh, and uh, and the body aggressively reacting to the implant. Um, But at the same time, there was no correlation between that necessarily and breast implant illness. Um, Now, is it possible that silicone gel bleed can be the cause of breast implant illness then, that the silicone kind of leaching through the shell? Well, there was a study published in December of 2023, so just a few months ago, that found no silicone in the capsules of saline implant patients uh, with BII, but there were silicone particles in the capsules of silicone implant patients with BII. Uh, And what the To kind of explain that is when they looked at the capsules, that scar tissue around the implants in patients who have saline implants and they suffered from BII, they did not find any silicone particles in that capsule. But they did find it in people who had silicone implants. And so what it showed was that if you have silicone implants, not saline, you may get some of that silicone particles that go into the outer shell, uh, through the outer shell, into the capsule but not with saline patients because the inside is saline. And about 50% of patients with BII have saline implants. So it doesn't make sense that silicone bleed would cause BII because then why are people who have saline implants who don't have silicone bleed getting BII? Um, so it, we don't think that necessarily it's just because you've got silicone inside that's, that's uh, bleeding out. Um, how about biofilm? Uh, biofilm essentially is a layer of bacteria that can grow on the surface of an implant, not so much bacteria that it would cause an infection or an abscess, um, but just enough bacteria that can kind of attach the, to the top of it or to the surface of the implant and cause the body to react to it. Um, there are some beliefs that that might be possible, possibly the cause of BII. Uh, there was a study published in 2022 that revealed a positive bacterial culture in 68% of patients with BII and 50% of them were Propionibacterium acnes. So this was a very common bacteria that we found uh, when uh, culturing patients' capsules with BII. But it was 50% of that was this bacteria, and only 68%, not 100%, of patients with BII had a positive bacterial contamination or a biofilm. Now, is it possible that they may have missed some? Maybe there's not enough bacteria that would actually grow it's hard to say, but once again, it's not super obvious that this is the cause. But it's, also, it's possible that it could be one of the contributing factors. And it takes me really to, I think, what I think is really the main cause of BII. And I think that it's not just one thing. I think it probably is a combination of factors that come together to create this in certain patients. And those factors could include a biofilm. It could include... Um, potential silicone reactivity by the patient. It could include uh, their own bodies, kind of their own hypersensitivities of their bodies. It could include genetics. There may be a lot of factors here that may contribute to BII that we just don't realize yet. Biofilm may be part of it. I think genetics may be part of it. Capsular contracture, that may be part of it as well when you get excess scar tissue. Likely it's due to a lot of things. 
Okay, so how do you treat BII? Um, and this is something that definitely is very controversial because there are plastic surgeons who offer all sorts of options. Um, so the first thing is to treat BII, number one, you've got to get rid of the implant. There are studies that show that if you have the implant removed uh, in somebody who has BII, that you have your chances of symptom improvement is anywhere from 55 to 95%. Um, there was a recent study also that showed that that symptom improvement does persist for over one year. So if your symptoms do get better when your implants are removed, it's likely that that symptom improvement can be long-lasting. Now, if you've got symptoms, but you have no previous diagnosis of autoimmune disease, then that's where you have a good chance that you're going to get better. And what I mean by that is if, let's say, you're a patient who's previously healthy, you have implants, and then a year later, you've got these symptoms, you've got uh, brain fog, you've got fatigue, muscle aches, hair is getting thinner, you're getting weird rashes, you have anywhere from a 55 to 95% chance of significant improvement in your symptoms if your implants are removed. But if you are somebody who already has a pre-existing diagnosis of autoimmune disease, that means you've already been diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome or uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, or any of these types of autoimmune diseases, then your chances of improvement with implant removal of a diagnosed autoimmune disease is not very good. Uh, and that's what I've seen in my own practice as well, is people who already have a diagnosis of autoimmune disease, especially if it's severe, you take their implants out, and they don't unfortunately seem to get a whole lot better. That's my clinical experience, but it's also what the studies are showing as well. Okay, so it's pretty obvious that if somebody's got BII, you got to remove the implants, and that's where they seem to improve. And it really, at this point, is, um, it is I would say, scientific fact that in people who have these types of symptoms, they don't have already pre-existing diagnosis, that, that they will, you know, a good percentage of them, 60 to 95%, are going to get better with implants. There are a lot of studies that have confirmed this. So if you get a plastic surgeon that tells you, oh, you've got all these studies, it's not going to help you if you have your implants taken out because it's in your head, they are not telling you the truth. They are gaslighting you. The fact is that the studies do show, and there are multiple studies that show, that implants being removed from somebody who has a constellation of BII symptoms, the vast majority of them have significant improvement in their symptoms. Maybe not 100%, but definite improvement, okay? So how do you, what do you do with the capsule? That's where it gets really controversial, and that's where the science is not quite as clear. So what is a capsule again? That is the scar tissue surrounding the implant, and everybody who has an implant that's healed has a capsule around it. Usually and ideally, that capsule is nice and thin, so you don't even know it's there. Uh, in some cases, and, and it's unfortunate, but sometimes that capsule can get really thick, and that can create what's called a capsular contracture, and that's excess scar tissue that can build up around the implant. So what do you do with it? Well, traditionally, BII advocates have said that you need to remove the capsule with the implant all in one big piece, and they label this as calling it an on-block removal. And what that means essentially is the implant and the scar tissue all comes out in one piece through one large incision on the breast. And the belief is that if you do it that way, then you are not going to contaminate the, the person's body with that implant or anything inside that capsular shell. Uh, and so there are plastic surgeons who are advertising this on-block resection of the implants uh, and saying that they're specialists in it, that they do it better than everybody else, and oh, by the way, they're going to charge you twice as much as somebody else who wants to take out your implant, uh, but you've got to go to them because they are the specialist for you. There is also a total capsulectomy. Total capsulectomy means removing the implant and the capsule, but not necessarily all in the same piece. And then there, is, there are people who may do a partial capsulectomy where some of the capsule is removed with it, but not all of it, and then there's some doctors who just take the implant out and leave the capsule alone. So if you have BII, what do you do? Well, once again, traditionally BII advocates uh, have often said that in order to get better, you need to have an on-block removal with the implant. So the implant and the capsule removed all at one time. Uh, and there was this belief, once again, that you may not get better if you don't do it this way. And the fact is, is that there is absolutely zero science to show that that is necessary. 
So what does the science say? Well, there was a study study published in February of 2024 that showed a 74% reduction in symptoms for patients with BII at six months when they didn't have any capsulectomy. And this was not statistically different from results of a partial or a total capsulectomy. So what they're essentially saying is that they had a 74% reduction in symptoms for people who had BII when their implants were removed, whether they had capsule removed, none of it removed, or some of it removed. It didn't seem to matter. There, the amount of improvement was the same whether the capsule was taken out or not. There was also a study published in 2023 of 150 subjects with a one-year follow-up, and they also showed no difference in outcome when they had no capsulectomy, a partial capsulectomy, a total capsulectomy, or an on-block capsulectomy. Capsulectomy means removing the capsule. So another study, 150 people, one-year follow-up, no difference whether the capsule was removed or whether it was left in place or whether you did an on-block. So that's a big deal because once again, you have people who are who are really putting information out there that is misinformation. It is not true saying that you need to get an on-block capsulectomy or even a total capsulectomy if you're going to get better. And if you don't get it, uh, that thing done, then you're not going to improve from your operation. And that just is not true. Um, okay, so what about... Other, uh, so what about a on block is um, is my concern? Okay, so the reason why I bring this up, number one, is because once again, there are plastic surgeons and there are other people who are gaslighting you. They are basically telling you falsehoods, and unfortunately, in the case of some of these plastic surgeons, it's so that they can make money off of you. It becomes essentially a marketing gimmick that they are the on block surgeon. Now, the reason why I'm not a big fan of on block capsulectomies with these operations is because it, it's actually in some ways an easier operation than a total capsulectomy. Total capsulectomy meaning removing of the scar tissue separately from the implant. Um, when you do an on-block capsulectomy, you have to make a large incision on the breast because if you're going to pull all that stuff out in one piece, the incision has to be very long to get it out of there. And that long incision creates a long scar and that long scar is permanent. And so you've got doctors who are out there creating these huge scars on women, performing unnecessary operations that are actually easier than the way I would do it, which is a total capsulectomy through a small incision, okay? And they're charging all this money trying to scare women into having it done with them because they want to make the money. And it is just plain wrong. Um, So if you've got BII and somebody tells you you have to get an on block, then ask them, where does the science show that this is necessary? And there just is none. Zero. Okay, so the big issue really with surgery, and I think it's so, so important, is the cosmetic appearance afterwards. And if you undergo a removal of your implants, how is it going to look? Well, in general, what happens when implants are removed is that your breasts will not droop lower, but they will lose projection. They don't stick out as much. And in some cases, if it's a small implant and if you've got a lot of your own native breast tissue, that difference may not hopefully be that big a deal unless you want it to be. In other cases, if you have somebody with a big implant and very little breast tissue, cosmetically, it can be a huge deal. So that's something to really keep in mind. So what do I do with my patients? Um, This is just a general um, uh, uh, overview of how I treat my patients Um, who have BII. Uh, The first thing is I have them get worked up by their primary care physician and or their rheumatologist. The number one thing, once again, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We want to make sure that their implants are truly making them sick and it's not something else. Second thing is then we go to surgery and I do perform a near complete or a complete capsulectomy with removal of the implants most of the time. Um, Now, these studies that are showing that removing the capsule may not be necessary are very new uh, and something that I would now talk with my patients and give them the option. That being said, a lot of patients still would say, look, I really would feel better if you remove the capsule. And if that's the case, you know, we can talk about that, explain the increase in invasiveness of it um, and decide for the patient, you know, with the patient what is best for them. But for most of my patients, until these studies now have recently been published, I performed either a near total or total capsulectomy, removing most, if not all, of the scar tissue to give them peace of mind that that that's not contributing to their symptoms. 
Uh, all of my patients, where we take their implants out, get a drain. Uh, and we do something special with the drain. We have them literally squeeze a bulb only a half hour, twice a day. Um, and this helps to actually improve the cosmetic appearance of their breasts afterwards. That's a big thing. When the implants are removed, like I mentioned earlier, it can really create a huge change to how the breasts look. Um, one of the big things that we see in some patients are unnatural creases on the breasts and these indentations and creases. Uh, and I do believe that's due to how the breast pocket heals together. And if we just do what we normally do with patients and just put a drain in and put it to suction and take it out a week later, oftentimes patients can get these weird indentations in their breasts that don't look natural and don't ever really go away. And so this was something that I really searched for many years for a solution for. And I had a doctor who told me at a conference one day that if you put the drain to suction a half hour twice a day, so you only suck fluid out a half hour two times a day, that that allows the breast to actually heal more naturally and the risk of cont- of these indentations and wrinkles and stuff is much lower and that's what I've seen in my patients. And so we typically do that. Um, we get all my patients are on pre and post-op supplements. Um, so we put them on a multivitamin, we put them on a probiotic, we put them on arginine and glutamine, uh, which are amino acids to help uh, with protein uh, breakdown that can occur in skeletal muscle after surgery. Um, I have them take antioxidants like vitamin C, We also put them on uh, arnica and bromelain uh, to help reduce inflammation as well as omega-3 fatty acid after three weeks. Uh, These are all very basic supplements I do think may help with the healing process. And then I tell my patients that if they want to do other detox activities on their own, I encourage them to do that, but it's not mandatory. Um, Things like cleaning up their diet, like doing an infrared sauna, like Plain exercise. These are great things to do. They may help with the overall kind of detoxing processes, uh, but there's no science to show that we know of that that's going to improve your symptoms or anything like that. But always be healthy no matter what. Um, So what about red light therapy? Uh, Red light therapy, I mean, could potentially help, especially in the healing process, maybe with the scars. Um, Totally optional. No science that I've seen that helps show that that's going to help you recover from BII or even from surgery. Um, IV nutrition is something that some people recommend after surgery. I'm not a big fan of IV nutrition. I'd rather have you take it by mouth. Um, I'm also concerned if you get a lot of IVs, are you going to blow out your veins eventually by creating scar tissue in those veins? And so I'm not a big fan of IV nutrition because let's say you're getting a lot of IVs, nutrition IVs and stuff. I know they're real popular right now, but let's say you're getting a bunch of them now and you're in your 20s, your 30s, when you're in your 60s or your 70s and you're older and Maybe you're in the hospital more. Are they going to be able to access those veins? Um, Maybe not if you've been using all these IVs and those veins are scarred down. Uh, And so I'm not a big fan of IV therapies. I think that um, we want to really save that for when we need it. Um, And then hyperbaric oxygen. Some people have recommended that for people who have BII. I've seen zero science to show that HBO is helpful in BII. I think in those patients who have healing issues, if your tissues are real thin and there's a concern about healing, then by all means, try uh, hyperbaric oxygen that may help create more oxygen in your tissues, maybe help prevent some healing problems, but I don't know of any necessary evidence that that can help with BII uh, or healing from BII surgery. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, there are people out there, um, you know, I mentioned people who are plastic surgeons who are selling on block surgery and how I do believe that that is not the right thing to do. Uh, and can be borderline unethical as well. Uh, but there are also people out there who are in the holistic health field who are selling detoxes, huge groups of supplements and things like that, that that they claim, oh, if you've got BII, you've got to take this or you're not going to get better. Um, you know, I actually did a Medline search for breast implant illness supplements or breast implant illness detox or breast implant illness cleanse uh, to see was there any science in any journals indexed anywhere in Medline that doing something like that can help with breast implant illness, and there were zero results. So I know of zero science, zero studies to show that you paying hundreds if not thousands of dollars for a detox or for a cleanse or something like that uh, is proven to help you heal from BII. Now, if you want to do that, then that's on you. It's probably not going to hurt, but I'm, but I think it's important for you to realize that you can heal from breast implant illness you know, without doing all that stuff. Um, And if you want to do it, by all means, feel free. Uh, But there's no science to show that these things are helpful or necessary to get better. I really 
would encourage you to to exercise caution if you have somebody who's telling you, you know, you've got to spend thousands of dollars on this or you're not going to get better. I mean, are they telling you the truth? Are they gaslighting you? Are they doing this just to try to take your money? That's something you really want to be careful of. Um, and so, and I do see that. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I've got some final thoughts about breast implant illness. Um, and it's something that I actually wrote down because I really want to make sure I convey at the end that I am not anti-breast implants. I still do a lot of breast augmentation, but I educate my patients about BII because I think it's so important to realize that not everybody reacts the same way to implants. I believe that breast implants are safe for the majority of people who want them, but I also believe that breast implant illness is real. I think that there is a percentage of people who get breast implants that get sick from them, and the only way for them to get better, unfortunately, is to get those implants taken out. So if you decide you want them, really just be aware. If you decide you want implants, just be aware that there is a chance that that they can potentially make you sick. I think that risk is not super high. We don't have specific numbers for them. I wish we did. Um, but I also think that there, for the vast majority of patients, breast implants can be very helpful for them to achieve their cosmetic goals and to help them uh, look and feel their best and feel confident and great in their own skin. And as always, uh, remember, eat real food, use clean skincare, and auto-juvenate before you operate.